Uh, we're to Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. You remember we left off, uh, Xerxes and Haman had kind of put their feet up, celebrating the fact that there is now an irreversible edict that commands the annihilation of the Jewish people. So Xerxes and Haman clink their glasses together and celebrate, and uh, the last little line of chapter 3 uh, it says not only that, but the people are bewildered. So here we pick up in chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came... There was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for the annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told them to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and re- reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As a high school sophomore, I had a front row seat to the kind of uh, slow and sliding compromise that we've been witnessing in Mordecai and Esther I watched as a close friend made the easy and small compromises of dress, speech, maybe musical or or movie interests that won him favor with the oldest and most popular in the school. It was cool, actually, to us, his group of friends, that he was getting invitations to to hang out with them and, and included in their plans, but compromises built, as we've seen. Even as my friend recounted stories of their parties and drunkenness, it was sadly mostly still exciting and novel for the rest of us to live vicariously through him. But compromise is built, again, as we've seen. My friend, for for our purposes, was firmly a servant of the empire, so much so that uh, I've said before, I recount a, a conversation with Becca at the lunch table, if you can think of you know, 15-year-old, 16-year-old Zach and Becca, uh, young love. Uh, but but m- making a conscious decision that, that if we were to be invited uh, 
to be out with him that, that we wouldn't any longer. It was that, that very evening, unbeknownst to me, that friend repented and demonstrated a radical transformation. And I only found out the next morning because he gave a testimony at chapel in front of the whole school. Many of you here experienced this story along with me, and you have your own observations. For my part, it was the first time in my life I had seen the power of God so radically change a person before my very eyes. And it was, to a large degree, what shaped me uh, in those years for, for the ministry I do now. If we learn nothing else tonight, no, genuine repentance results in genuine and total transformation of the whole person. Genuine repentance results in genuine and total transformation of the whole person. The testimonies of both Mordecai and Esther depict for us the kind of transformed life, vision, and purpose that follow this kind of genuine repentance. First, let's consider Mordecai. Remember that chapter 3 ends with Haman reclining with a drink, reveling at a job well done. Those pesky Israelites, he may have thought, will finally be annihilated. But the Jews everywhere respond very differently. Chapter 3, verse 15, describes the people as bewildered. Mordecai's response is to tear his clothes, to put on sackcloth and ashes and weep. This behavior is consistent with how Scripture describes repentance. Consider Nehemiah. We had a series on Nehemiah not too long ago. Writing, prophesying in a very similar time period under Persian rule. Nehemiah describes this kind of behavior in chapter 9, 1 and 2. The Israelites gathered together, fasting, and wearing sackcloth and having dust on their heads. Same behavior we're observing in Mordecai. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the wickedness of their fathers. So here we have it. Mordecai comes face to face with his own mortality and the edict of death hanging over him and he repents. Theologian J.I. Packer describes repentance so beautifully. He writes, The New Testament word for repentance means changing one's mind so that one's views, values, goals, and ways are changed and one's whole life is lived differently. The change is radical, both inwardly and outwardly. Mind and judgment, will and affections, behavior and lifestyle, motives and purposes are all involved. Repenting means starting to live a new life. Do we take confession this seriously? It seems to me that we often view our confession as though it were a whiteboard. I told you I stole a couple of paragraphs this morning. And over the course of the week, we mark up our whiteboard, right? Confession, we think, is the act of God wiping the slate clean and setting us back to white. But this isn't it, or at least it's a very incomplete picture of what we ought to be doing in the act of confessing. The idea of being made white belongs to the sphere of justification, Okay? There, is, there is a moment in time where God wipes the slate clean, but it's also not very much like a whiteboard. It's like we're, we're some other nature entirely, and God changes us into white. That's the sphere of justification. There is a being made, you know the catchy thing, being made just as if I'd never sinned. But when believers come before the Lord in confession, we ought to think about confession as our lump of clay, being worked at by the master potter. He presses our flaws and imperfections to make us more and more into the kind of vessel he intends. To this end, if, if being made just as if I'd never sinned, being made white belongs to the sphere of justification, a believer's time of confession belongs to the sphere of sanctification. That we're not moving from the sphere of 
unsaved to saved anymore. When we come before God in confession, the idea is not that we've fallen from from grace and and we need Jesus to, to bring us back onto the right side. That's not what we're doing when we confess, right? I hope we know enough to to have our idea of salvation a little bit more firm than that. When we come before God in confession, what we're doing is saying, I need to be shaped even further. I need need to press further into the newness of life that God has called me to. So is that moment in our liturgy each week, the time of confession, is it calling you further into newness of life? Drawing on that quote from J.I. Packer about what repentance is, does it meaningfully impact your views, values, goals? Does it meaningfully impact the way you live your life in the week that follows? Does it meaningfully impact your will and affections, your motives? Remember that I'm always preaching to myself, and the answer for me is that it's not. It's just a thing we do. We should learn from the example of Mordecai. If we trace Mordecai's character arc through this chapter, we see that he does have this new and radical change. Note first his attitude toward the new clothes in chapter 4, verse 4. Esther sends him the kind of clothing that would allow him to enter the palace and solve his problems there, but he would not accept them, it says. Imagine this, from from Mordecai, who we've come to know as, as as a good servant of the empire, who's made all manner of sacrifices to, to cozy up to the empire. Mordecai's rejection of the clothes is a statement. The empire is not my friend, and the empire is not my protector. I have a problem that needs solving, and I'm not going in there to find the answer. Second, consider Mordecai's attitude we find reflected in his response to Esther's doubts. Look at chapter 4, 13 through 14. Mordecai's famous words here. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family, father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. The empire is not my friend. and The empire is not my protector. But God will deliver. Mordecai has a new or at least refreshed faith in God that gives him radical confidence. He knows beyond a doubt that God is his deliverer and has a certainty, or we might describe it as an assurance, that God will deliver. This is incredible, considering an irreversible edict commanding his annihilation from the foremost authority in the world currently hangs over Mordecai's head. And yet Mordecai can say, God will deliver me. Esther, however, is in a different place. Spiritually, yes, she's in a different place. But physically, she's literally in a different place. In verse 4, when she sees Mordecai in his sackcloth and his ashes and and the dust on his head, she sends him nice clothes, a move so tone-deaf, even the apostle Peter might blush. In Esther's defense, this was probably just an attempt to dress him up so she could talk to him. I want to talk to you, but but you got to put on the kind of clothes that will will get you in here. I want to help, okay? As it is, Esther has to settle to communicate through a mediator. Notice that Esther's distance from the covenant community, the Israelites here, is alarming. Though 4 verse 3, in every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Esther has zero self-awareness. Every province... The people are bewildered and responding in repentance. And Esther's like, 
Mordecai, what's wrong? Esther has zero self-awareness. She has no idea what's happening to her people, what's happening to the covenant community of God. It speaks of her separation from the covenant community, and it may have cost her her life. There's two things to note there. Lack of self-awareness and the threat of death by being separated from the covenant community. So we should pause here and consider our own participation in the covenant community, the church. I understand your average evening service attender probably doesn't need this exhortation, but we are not two churches. We are not two classes of believer here. So when a text comes to bear on us, we preach it. Participation with the covenant community has, in many ways, waned in recent years. Let me first ground us a bit so we don't panic or cast a bunch of stones. There are some very positive signs of health here. I don't right or wrong, I'm a very faithful evening service attendance tracker. I often count. And evening service attendance has grown about 50% in the last couple of years, from uh, almost always between 65 and 70 to almost always between 90 and 100. Participation among congregants here is in some kind of midweek Bible study or, or service opportunity is very high comparatively. We've got new ministries going all over the place, journeymen and rooted, small group revitalization, fourth and fifth grade catechism, a, a second joy women's Bible study has to open, and another men's Bible study on Thursdays. Still, there seems to have been a change in participation, uh, a participation with the church post-COVID, and I, I don't like defining things by COVID, uh, but it is part of the catalyst here. Post-COVID, it seems that there's been a change in the participation with the church. My observation is that people are more likely to miss. The person who be before was here nine out of 10 weeks is now here six out of 10. The church has to take part of the blame here. Pastor Drew and I have both lamented doing the best with the information we had at a time, we, we shut down services and probably wouldn't do that again or, or knowing more would have made a different decision. And in so doing, I think we gave people permission not to be here. Like, it's not that important. You can watch online and get the same gist, right? That's, that's certainly not what we intended, but, but that's the sentiment that I, I think got across But also, people have taken up this idea that the Sabbath is for them, and and that means they can do with it as they please, which is a a terrible twisting of the way Jesus talked about the Sabbath. I get particularly annoyed when when people have some type of excuse like, I I can worship God anywhere. Why do I need to come to church? I can worship God out in nature. And I I would give them this test. Probably the, the easiest most basic way to know if you're worshiping God is, is to ask if you're singing praise to him. Read the Psalms. Singing praise to God is like level one worship. So ask that person that says, I can worship God anywhere. I can worship him out in nature. I can worship him on the golf course. I can worship him, uh, we watch with coffee on our, on our porch. Are you singing? Level one, basic worship. If that's not happening, I'd say, participate with the church. Be, beware of growing distant from the people of God. We are called to live together in community. Esther's failure here highlights two immediate reasons why this benefits both us, the individual, and the church. First, away from the community of believers, we become unaware of the burdens and needs of our neighbors. We're unable to pray for them or meet their material needs, leaving them to carry their burdens alone. You have something to offer when you're here. Second, the individual loses self-awareness. Like Esther, we become unaware of our own burdens and weaknesses. We forego the help of the community of believers available to us. Regular corporate confession in the gathered worship service helps remind us of our failings and needs. 
or, or even to identify failures and needs for us. Consider the Apostle Paul when he says, I would not have even known what coveting was if the law of God didn't tell me. We become aware of our weakness when we're here together and participate in, in corporate worship. We become aware of things we're prone to ignore or forget if left to ourselves. The routine call to confess an exhortation to believe and obey keeps us properly engaged with and growing in Christ. Esther, for her part, makes an effort to re-engage with the covenant community. If only with a toe in the water. She sends somebody out. She's not going to leave the palace quite yet, her beauty treatments and all. She sends a servant to, to, to investigate for her. She'd really like to know what's up with Mordecai. Remaining still comfortably in the palace, she sends her servant to investigate the situation. And this investigation takes some time. Her change doesn't happen immediately. In fact, the bulk of our text this evening is this back and forth between Mordecai and Esther. But notice the veracity in verses 7 and 8 in particular. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. So through this process of re-engaging with the community and growing in her knowledge of herself and her situation, Esther comes to know the details, the truth. Your nature is such that it is condemned. Ultimately, it's this knowledge of her condemnation that prompts her to repent. What? an important and advantageous place to be, to know your wages and the death that awaits you. For it's here we're made to humble ourselves before the true and living deliverer. John Calvin famously says, to this extent, we are prompted by our own ills to contemplate the good things of God. And we cannot seriously aspire to him before we begin to become displeased with ourselves. A little later, he writes, Accordingly, the knowledge of ourselves not only arouses us to seek God, but also, as it were, leads us by the hand to find him. And this is what Esther experiences. Through the ministry of the covenant community and through the knowledge of her own judgment, the Spirit moves her to repent. If you have questions about maybe why I'm, I'm, I'm calling it confession and, and repentance, uh, aside from, from the sackcloth and the ashes that sort of highlight that for us, uh, you could look at the additions to Esther we mentioned a few weeks ago, which, which is not scripture. Uh, it's, a, it's at least a couple hundred years after the story of Esther, but at least gives us a window into the way that, that a, a more contemporary audience was reading that story. And in it, in the additions to Esther is Esther's prayer that happens here before she goes to the king. And Esther repents of her idolatry. She repents of her marriage to King Xerxes. So Esther realizes that she's done some things wrong, that she's been separated from God by her sin. And she confesses her sin in repentance, and it changes her. She joins in the fasting and the public confession. And as we've seen already with Mordecai, with genuine repentance comes genuine transformation. For the first time in the entire book, the book that bears her name, nearly halfway through, Esther speaks for herself. She's not doing everything Mordecai says or whatever Haggai suggests. She's not even speaking through a mediator any longer. Esther's transformation brings a status and self-confidence to this point we have never seen in her. She speaks for herself. She decides for herself. She even gives orders to Mordecai and the entire covenant community. This is the kind of transformation and new life that's available 
to the believer, to the spirit-filled believer. All these things that Esther thought she'd get from the empire, status, self-confidence, self-worth, true beauty, true peace, freedom, she doesn't find in the empire, but she actually finds in her deliverer, Yahweh. This new life in Christ, of course, does not come with ease. It's a little section we haven't dealt with yet. Verses 9 through 11. Esther realizes that what's before her is a death sentence. Even separate from, from the edict about her annihilation. She says, there's a law that if I go unrequested before the king, here's what will happen. Josephus describes, we'll read some of this, this next week, Guards on either side with axes. And all Xerxes has to do is flick his wrist, and, and there it is. It's the end for Esther. This new life is not all hunky-dory. It's not all sunshine and roses. Esther has a challenge. Esther has an opportunity to act. Esther has an opportunity to, as, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians 2.12, work out her salvation with fear and trembling. She, she certainly knows fear and trembling here. Or, or Esther has an opportunity to, as, as James says it in, in 2.18, show you her faith by her works. But here's the, the tension we have to hold. Ultimately, Esther is not the deliverer. I'll remind you of Mordecai's faithful and correct observation in 4.14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. The story, of, the story is not up to Esther. The fate of the people does not hang in the balance. God has ordained all things. We see in Esther an admirable example of faith and human activity. Faith in action. In her own famous words, if I perish, I perish. We're reminded of the more perfect example of Christ who faced an even more perilous fate as he approached the cross. Esther went out to intervene for God's people with the threat of dying. Christ went out to intervene for God's people with the purpose of dying. So hear the call to continued confession and therefore to further newness of life because we have even more reason than Mordecai and Esther to be certain of our deliverance. No longer do we say a relief and deliverance will arise from another place, but rather relief and deliverance has risen from Christ alone. This evening, have your views, values, and goals, your mind, will, and affections, your behavior, lifestyle, and purpose changed further in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Follow the example of Esther as she follows the pattern of Christ. Amen. Let's pray.